I wish I would have thought more about it being April Fool's Day. I would have had some type of little joke here for you guys, but instead, uh, you no, know, we'll just get right into it. So again, like they mentioned, I'm Andrew Tritter. I'm the bi-campus laryngology fellow here at Columbia and Cornell. Um, <clears throat> and today I want to talk about something that uh, is interesting to me. I, I, I kind of developed a little personal uh, interest in reading about this and learning more about it through cases and uh, conferences over the last couple of years. Um, and it's an area that's very easily accessible to most general otolaryngologists, but really hasn't become something that's uh, frequently talked about or often discussed. Um, and uh, it's really, you know, with regards to swallowing pathology, this is uh, a part of the throat that is also very easily accessible from a surgical and a therapy standpoint for us as clinicians. So I want to talk a little bit about the pharyngoesophageal segment, um, talking a little about just the basic physiology of the area, how it functions, um, the, uh, the pathophysiology that can kind of uh, impact that function, and then talk about those things with regards to how we evaluate the pharyngoesophageal segment from a diagnostic standpoint, um, before just touching on different types of therapeutic options that we have as clinicians for addressing this, uh, this segment of the throat. Um, and then briefly at the end, kind of touch on some newer directions and newer pathology um, that we're learning more about and beginning to uh, start working on. So getting started, what is the pharyngoesophageal segment? This is an area that I'm sure most people probably more commonly refer to as the upper esophageal sphincter. Um, just some minor really clarification points. A pharyngoesophageal segment refers to an anatomic area specifically of three separate muscles, the inferior aspect of the inferior pharyngeal constrictors, uh, the cricopharyngeus muscle, and the upper fibers of the proximal esophageal musculature. Whereas the upper esophageal sphincter uh, usually refers to uh, a two to four centimeter area of high pressure, um, specifically that you would see on manometry. We'll talk a little bit more about manometry and how it plays a role in evaluating this area later, but just uh, for kind of a you know, brief mention, on this type of manometry readout, you'd see uh, distance on the y-axis from the nose at the top down to the stomach and the bottom time in the y-axis. And you see with a individual act of swallowing here, you see pressure changes that are represented by different colors. So warmer colors representing higher pressure. And this is all done through a catheter in the nose that runs down this track uh, and gives you a sense of where different pressures can be, um, can be problematic um, along the, uh, the pathway of swallowing. So, Again, these two areas are essentially equivalent and these terms can pretty much be used interchangeably. Um, the one thing to note though, that the cricopharyngeus muscle, which we most commonly, I think, talk about as a laryngologist within the pharyngoesophageal segment is not the same as these two things. There's more to the pharyngoesophageal segment than just the cricopharyngeus muscle, um, though we will focus a large amount of our efforts today on talking about that muscle specifically as the more problematic of the group. So from a functional standpoint, um, so from a functional standpoint, the cricopharyngeus muscle and the, uh, the inferior aspect of the uh, pharyngeal constrictors and the esophageal uh, musculature, you know, these are tonically contracted at rest um, and you know, they're innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the pharyngeal plexus. Um, and they remain contracted at rest because their function really isn't one of actively participating in bolus transit through the, um, from the pharynx into the esophagus. It's more a protective function. Uh, and the upper esophageal sphincter really helps to prevent both air aphasia. So as we breathe and as we speak, helps prevent um, you know, bringing that extra air into the, the GI tract. Um, but the other thing that it really helps do is helps prevent uh, aspiration of gastroesophageal reflux contents. Um, so, you know, that's important to think about uh, later as we th see things like cricopharyngeal bars and, um, you know, obstruction at the level of the pharyngoesophageal sphincter as potentially a, a consequence of things like reflux. Uh, and it's really kind of the pharyngoesophageal sphincter trying to actively uh, work hard to prevent those types of chronic conditions that, that you may see. So we'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, so let's start with, you know, the actual physiology of the pharyngoesophageal segment. Um, while swallowing in and of itself is a highly complex process from, from the teeth all the way to the stomach, uh, the pharyngoesophageal segment is no uh, exception to that, uh, that rule and has a fairly complex process for how it functions. Um, first uh, described by Jacob et al. in 1989, there are five stages to the opening of the pharyngoesophageal segment. Uh, the first of which is going to be, um, and I'll, I'll let this kind of play as, as I talk about them so you can kind of see these individual actions within the diagram to the right. 
but the first of which is going to be muscular relaxation of the cricopharyngeus muscle. So this muscle is going to be tonically contracted at baseline, like we mentioned. And the first thing that has to happen is you have to have inhibition of that contraction so that the pharyngoesophageal segment can actually then open, uh, as we'll see in the later steps. So once that relaxation occurs, the next thing that happens is you're going to have elevation of the hyoid and the larynx up underneath the tongue. Um, this is actually the, the first part of active opening of the pharyngoesophageal segment. Normally the larynx is gonna sit low in the neck up against the spine, and it's elevating this framework off of the spine that actually provides the opening for the pharyngoesophageal segment. Um, as that primes the pharyngoesophageal segment for opening by lifting it higher, the next thing you have is actually distension of the pharyngoesophageal segment um, through the actions of lingual contraction and pharyngeal contraction, propelling the bolus down through the pharyngoesophageal segment. Uh, it's important to note that the pharyngoesophageal segment is really only going to open as much as necessary to accommodate this incoming bolus. Um, so it's more of a of just the distension from the bolus that provides the opening. The extent to which it can open is determined by elevation, relaxation of the muscle, but it's only going to open as much as necessary to accommodate uh, what's coming at it. And then once the bolus is actually passed through the pharyngoesophageal segment, the next thing you have is the passive closure where um, the elastic recoil of the laryngeal framework back towards the um, spinal canal um, closes off that segment before finally uh, the uh, cricopharyngeus muscle undergoes active closure again uh, through muscular contraction. So aging effects on this area in particular just really kind of help reiterate the, the normal physiology by talking about where things can go wrong. Um, sarcopenia is important to, to mention because, you know, as we age, the amount of, of muscle fibers that we have within our muscles is going to decrease and lead to you know, excessive weakness in certain areas of the body. Um, but the pharynx is no exception to that rule. So as these muscles um, lose their strength with age, it becomes harder for the pharynx to contract and propel things through the esophageal sphincter. Um, other things that you may see would be a decreased laryngeal height. Uh, so as we age, the larynx tends to sag lower and lower in the neck. Um, meaning that as, as we try and swallow, the larynx now has a much higher distance that it has to travel in order to elevate itself off of the spine and actually distend the pharyngoesophageal segment. Um, so kind of going along with this, you might see decreased upper esophageal sphincter opening. Another thing that happens um, in association with situations like degenerative spinal changes that may give you like some kyphosis of the spine, um, you know, kind of moving the, the whole head a little bit more anteriorly, is they're gonna widen the area of the pharynx. Uh, so a widened area combined with a weaker pharynx from you know, just muscle effects um, mean a weaker pharynx that is not going to be able to propel a bolus as easily through the upper esophageal sphincter. It's also not opening as much as it was before. So um, all that really, I think, kind of helps drive home the, the key points about how this section of, of the pharynx and esophagus really functions specifically in the act of swallowing. So when we evaluate the pharyngoesophageal segment, um, I like to think about it as kind of a, a stepwise approach um, from everything at the bedside to some of our more high-tech technology uh, to, to look at the function of this area. So starting with something as simple as a bedside swallow evaluation, which you know obviously begins with just a history from the patient. What kind of dysphagia are they having? Um, are you having problems with just liquids alone, which may suggest something like more of a sensory deficit rather than a physical obstruction? Um, is it solids and liquids, which could suggest anything from not just pharyngoesophageal segment uh, dysfunction, but also issues with pharyngeal strength uh, or esophageal emptying, things backing up into the pharynx. Um, asking the patient to point to where they feel like they're having difficulty swallowing or, or the issue in general um, can be helpful to some extent as far as telling you where the problem might be. Um, but it's important to remember that a third of patients who are going to localize their dysphagia above the level of the chest, above the clavicles, are um, actually gonna have an esophageal abnormality on, on their further evaluation. So have to keep that in mind that the, that the pharynx and pharyngoesophageal segment are not the only area where you may see problems. Uh, as a corollary to that, patients who point to their chest usually do have an esophageal abnormality responsible for their dysphagia. Um, nevertheless, just important to be aware of. But as part of this exam, you wanna also make sure you palpate the larynx and make sure that it's elevating in the way that it needs to. So are you feeling that larynx rise up in the, in the neck towards the mandible? Uh, if it's not, you're probably not getting as much distension and opening of the pharyngoesophageal segment as you would need to actually clear a bolus. Um, so if you start to see after multiple swallows at the bedside, um, 
or after you know one swallow attempt, the patient has to swallow multiple times to get that to go down. You start to hear a wet quality to their voice, suggesting that things may be going into the airway rather than through the segment. Um, you know that could be suggestive aspiration and difficulty, and you obviously want to look into things a little bit further. Um, again, uh, bedside swallow evaluation is not a uh, foolproof test. You may miss aspiration in up to 40% of people, so really need to make sure that. Um, that it's just an introductory diagnostic tool to kind of point you in the right direction of what may be going on with the patient. So the next thing that most of all of us are going to do regardless is a flexible laryngoscopy. And while not a dynamic test as far as letting you see what's happening during the whole course of a swallow, it gives you good snapshot images of different signs that may be indicative of certain types of pathology uh, within both the pharynx and the pharyngoesophageal segment, and possibly even the esophagus as well. So uh, certain things that you may be looking for or see on flexible laryngoscopy, pooling of secretions is probably the more common one. Um, so if you see pooling of secretions or you know, retained food particles, liquids from swallowing, um, that could be suggestive of outflow obstruction at the level of the pharyngoesophageal segment, potentially lower too, um, but that's just one thing to be aware of. Especially if you see that on one side more than the other, it may be indicative of a weakness in one side of the pharynx. It's not able to adequately clear uh, those secretions with that bolus on that side. Um, so that may give you an indication of a pharyngeal problem in addition to a uh, pharyngoesophageal segment problem. You also just wanna look at the structural anatomy of what you're, what you're seeing. Um, are there massive osteophytes at the hypopharynx or in the pharynx that are gonna cause obstruction uh, with epiglottic inversion or just pure bolus transit? Um, especially if these are lower down at the level of the cricopharynx or pharyngoesophageal segment, you're going to have obstruction at that level too, which is going to limit the amount of area that a bolus can transit through. Um, other things that you can do is have the patient perform a valsalva maneuver blowing against their cheeks, which helps to stand open the piriform sinuses uh, and see a little bit more of the pharyngoesophageal segment. The, uh, the first image here is uh, actually uh, a maneuver that's been talked about having a patient voluntarily belch, if they're able to, of course, which uh, not only helps kind of open up and distend the pharyngoesophageal segment, but opens up the sphincter a little bit more as that reflexively opens up, um, you know, the, the phycopharyngeus muscle during a belch. Um, so you can see into the esophageal inlet right there. Um, this would be useful if you're looking for things like cricopharyngeal webs, which you can see in the picture here on the right. Um, this patient is performing a valsalva maneuver, uh, distending their piriform sinuses, and here you see a small web on the left-hand side. Um, that, you know, while present can be a significant source of dysphagia in certain individuals. Another thing that's important during this exam is to have the patient perform a pharyngeal squeeze maneuver. Um, originally described by Bob Ashton, I think in the 90s, but it's an important maneuver to help get a sense of the, the strength of the pharynx specifically. So uh, having the patient perform a high-pitched E sound um, kind of loudly uh, will give you an idea of to what extent their pharynx is contracting. So as you see, this patient is you know, giving us that forceful high pitch E and you see the pharynx moving in on all sides, indic uh, indicative of good quality pharyngeal strength and contraction. Versus this patient here, uh, who's trying to make the same maneuver and is clearly not having the same amount of movement within their pharyngeal walls. Also have a little bit of you know, retained secretions uh, from a, a fees exam, uh, which segues nicely into talking about that. So a fees exam is a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. This is a test performed with flexible laryngoscopy oftentimes uh, with our speech pathology colleagues, uh, who in general tend to be a very uh, useful resource when evaluating dysphagia, uh, almost an essential resource. Uh, but uh, the exam is performed by having the patient uh, eat, swallow different types of uh, food consistencies, liquids, uh, usually dyed with color, so you can watch the passage of these contents through the pharynx. It is um, not a complete view as you get a white out of the pharynx during the swallowing process, so you're not able to see the entire process but you can see things like residue in certain areas in the molecular, the piriforms. Um, you can see um, the residue of you know, things that have been aspirated or penetrated into the laryngeal vestibule or airway. Um, so you at least get a sense of what's happening uh, after the swallow for sure. Um, this in conjunction with things like the pharyngeal squeeze maneuver can give you a better sense of whether or not you have problems at the level of the pharyngoesophageal segment. So uh, for example, if you have an intact pharyngeal squeeze, uh, but you have incomplete bolus clearance on a fees exam, that might be an indication that you have outflow obstruction at the level of the pharyngoesophageal segment uh, versus you know, the absence of a pharyngeal squeeze, incomplete clearance would suggest something like pharyngeal weakness as the cause rather than uh, 
pharyngoesophageal segment dysfunction or obstruction. So moving on now to video fluoroscopy, um, you know, either our barium swallows or modified barium swallow studies. Um, this is essentially the gold standard diagnostic tool that we use when evaluating um, dysphagia of the upper digestive tract, but you know, the pharyngoesophageal segment in particular. The test is usually performed with a radiologist, um, plus or minus a speech pathologist, if a modified uh, barium swallow study is being performed specifically, but with the administration of various consistencies of liquids and foods, uh, uh, that have been uh, that had barium added to them. You can see on X-ray essentially where these things are clearing through the pharynx into the esophagus, uh, if any is being retained. Um, you can also get a sense of the degree of uh, pharyngoesophageal segment opening, the amount to which the larynx and hyoid are elevating off of the spine. Um, you can get a sense of how strong the pharynx is contracting, um, as well as just the coordination between all of these areas in general. Um, depending on where and how these studies are performed, you can actually have objective measurements that can be used in your patient evaluations, um, if not for research purposes as well. Um, this can be done by having, for example, a, a small ring of a known size in the frame so that you can then use it as a reference measuring point. Um, but so, for example, if you're going to measure something like hyolaryngeal elevation using these reference points, um, you know, you'll be able to get a sense of where the patient falls within the range of normal values. Normal laryngeal elevation can range anywhere from two and a half to four centimeters, depending on the patient's age, gender, and bolus size. Uh, men tend to have a higher degree of elevation because their larynx sits lower in the neck. Uh, younger people uh, don't need to elevate as much because the larynx hasn't distended and sagged like it usually does with age. And then also you'll have more of an elevation with a larger bolus size too. But again, this can be measured uh, using these metrics. Um, pharyngeal strength is something that can also be measured. And so, you know, you don't necessarily have to measure it to get a sense of what's happening with these studies. Um, it just gives you a, a better objective view of what's happening. And to do that objectively, you can measure what's called the pharyngeal constriction ratio, which is essentially a measurement of the pharyngeal area uh, during maximal contraction of the pharynx during a swallow uh, over the maximal pharyngeal area that you would see while a bolus is being held in the mouth. This value should normally approach zero in a patient without any swallowing difficulties. But as that gets you know, above 0.25, your aspiration risk uh, or association with aspiration risk increases. Um, and again, you can just generally get a sense of if there is a, uh, a significant difference in those sizes, if the, the pharynx area at rest with the bolus held in the mouth is very wide, um, you may have some issues with contraction uh, or weakness from dilation of the pharynx. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that may be dilated in just a little bit. So moving on for our last kind of high-tech tool for evaluating the pharyngoesophageal segment, manometry is um, one that we touched on a little bit earlier, but high-resolution manometry uh, uses a catheter through the nose, um, like I said, to measure pressure along various points of the upper digestive tract. Um, it's the gold standard for esophageal motility specifically, but more recently it's become a more useful tool for oropharyngeal uh, dysphagia and evaluation of the pharynx. Um, when you're looking at these, uh, so the upper esophageal sphincter is this upper bar, lower esophageal sphincter is this lower bar that you see in the frame here. Um, and then there's this little little peak right above where the swallow initiates uh, right at this point here. So this is gonna be representative of pharyngeal contraction uh, into the upper esophageal segment. So when we're talking about the pharyngoesophageal segment, uh, it's important to focus on this area too, to get a sense of, of the, the extent to which the pharynx is able to contract and propel a bolus uh, through an open upper esophageal sphincter, uh, open as you can see here by virtue of the uh, cooler colors, so the pressure has, has decreased in that area, uh, and then see the response afterwards and where the upper esophageal sphincter returns as far as resting pressure once a bolus has cleared that, gone into the esophagus, and moved uh, downward. And we'll touch a little bit more on about how we can use that as far as treatment uh, goes a little bit later. So let's start to talk about uh, the spectrum of pathology that we can see in the pharyngoesophageal segment. Um, there are many different types of conditions that can affect this particular area of the body. Um, I mean, everything from myopathic conditions, inclusion body myositis is a particular condition that's well known to affect the correct pharyngeus muscle, as well as uh, oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. Um, other degenerative neurologic conditions can certainly contribute. Um, stroke, that sort of thing has a general impact on the overall function of the area. Um, even iatrogenic causes. So people who've had surgery in the area of, of the pharynx and larynx, uh, particularly damage to the current laryngeal nerve, 
or pharyngeal plexus may have weakness as a result of that type of injury. And then compensatory changes from things like reflux. Um, reflux has been shown to, or at least acidification of the esophagus, has been shown to lead to increased upper esophageal sphincter pressures. Um, so that can be part of the reason why a patient is having issues in that area. And oftentimes it's just idiopathic and we don't know, but um, we'll start by talking about how we can identify some of these findings using fluoroscopy specifically as our main workhorse for evaluating the pharyngoesophageal segment to talk about some of these more common findings. So when looking at the pharyngoesophageal segment, the, there are two kind of areas that you wanna focus on. First of which is the posterior hypopharyngeal area and the other is the posterior cricoid. The posterior hypopharyngeal area is kind of the posterior aspect of the pharyngoesophageal segment. So this is when you're looking at a lateral view, it's the posterior aspect of that segment as a bolus transits through the pharyngoesophageal segment. You may see things like uh, cricopharyngeal muscle bars. Uh, this is where your zinc or diverticulum will show up um, or you're looking at osteophytes on the spine, all projecting on that posterior aspect of the PES um, versus posterior cricoid, which is directly behind the cricoid cartilage, projecting into that anterior portion of the pharyngoesophageal segment. But let's start by talking about the posterior hypopharynx and some of the things that you might see there. Um, so in a normal setting, like we mentioned, the pharyngoesophageal opening really depends on the size of the bolus that it is receiving. Um, so as you can see in, in this study by Leonard et al. from 2000, they showed that normal PES opening uh, definitely changes and increases with a progressively enlarging bolus. And there's a normal range, you know, for each of these, you know, depending on age, gender, and those sorts of things we talked about before. But um, the important cutoff here using these normative values that they established was anything less than about 0.6 centimeters is going to be suggestive of obstruction at the level of the uh, pharyngoesophageal segment. This is important because so long as you have that much of an opening, you should be able to still at least get a bolus through without significant difficulty but you may still see a cricopharyngeal bar in certain cases. The important thing to note is that you may not have a patient with dysphagia in the setting of a cricopharyngeal bar. It doesn't necessarily imply that there's a problem just because a bar is there. However, these bars can be very common just in general. Um, in a study by uh, that same author in 2004, um, looking at patients over 65, over 30% uh, were found to have a CP bar on their fluoro exam. So, um, to kind of reiterate that point, you know, here's an example of a patient with what would be considered a non-obstructing uh, cricopharyngeal bar uh, because it's still greater than 0.6 centimeters and uh, contrast is able to flow pretty clearly past that uh, on a, a fluoroscopy exam versus someone who has a more moderately obstructing bar. And that's kind of between the 0.3 to 0.6 centimeter range as far as opening, again, on the lateral view that you would see right here um, with that significant bar kind of projecting right behind it all the way up to something that's a little bit more severe and less than 0.3 centimeters of opening. Um, and you know, this kind of hints at what you might see with something like a Zanker's diverticulum, which is actually a little bit uh, of, you know, just the, the next progression in this, um, this spectrum of cricopharyngeal um, dysfunction, where uh, progressively worsening obstruction by a bar leads to outpouching above that bar of the pharyngeal mucosa through Killian's dehiscence, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a second, um, but that just kind of shows you, you know, the spectrum from non-obstructing all the way up to the diverticulum at the kind of end stage of CP hypertrophy dysfunction. Um, important to reiterate too that, you know, this bar usually exists for a reason, uh, and there are some protective effects that they can offer. So take, for example, this esophagram, uh, rather than, you know, barium swallow, but you're looking at a patient here with really significant gastroesophageal reflux coming all the way back up to the pharyngoesophageal segment, and you'll kind of get a better sense of where you are in a second as the patient takes another swallow, and you see that significant bar sitting right here. That bar is likely a response to chronic reflux that the patient's undergoing, um, sitting there trying to, to protect this patient from aspirating these chronic reflux contents into the pharynx and potentially into the airway. Um, so it's just another reminder not to forget the esophagus as a potential contributor to why you are having dysfunction at the level of the pharyngoesophageal segment. Um, and there are implications for these bars on the rest of the pharynx as well. Um, the uh, one, one particular study by Dr. Belosky's group at UC Davis in 2010 looked at the um, correlation between the size and degree of obstruction of a cricopharyngeal bar, all the way up from no obstruction to Zanker's diverticulum, uh, and seeing the extent to which the pharyngeal constriction ratio uh, increased with that progressive bar. 
So essentially what this translates to is as you have a more tight sphincter, a tighter pharyngoesophageal segment, the pharynx is gonna to have to work harder to push against that to propel a bolus through it. So that working harder against it will eventually lead to dilation and weakening of those muscles. So you get a widened pharyngeal area, uh, increasing that metric that we talked about earlier, the pharyngeal constriction ratio. So at the end of that spectrum, again, we mentioned the um, Zanker's diverticulum is kind of the end stage of the CP bar spectrum, uh, which again, it's a distension uh, through Killian's dehiscence in the area between the lower border of the inferior constrictors and the upper fibers of the cricopharyngeus muscle. Um, so a pseudo, pseudo diverticulum of those mucosal contents uh, out posteriorly behind the cricopharyngeus uh, muscle. Now, the way we manage this in particular, I know we haven't touched on a lot of treatment yet, but I think it's important for mentioning the treatment now as we discuss the types of things you might see on fluoroscopy. This can be managed either endoscopically or open, as many of you probably have done before. Um, the endoscopic approach is usually done with a diverticular scope, which suspends that cricopharyngeal bar uh, between its tines. This is actually a slimline diverticular scope uh, rather than uh, the weirdo, which may be more common for a lot of you. Um, but you're looking at the esophageal inlet above and the Zanker's diverticulum pouch below. And this is actually a, a ligature that is being used to seal off uh, the, um, the cricopharyngeal bar and then divide it, essentially opening up uh, outflow of contents within the pouch into the rest of the esophagus uh, versus the you know, more traditional classic approach of an open excision of a Zanker's diverticulum that actually fully removes the pouch rather than just opening it up or flow of contents into the esophagus. Um, so as you can see in the picture on the right, this is a fluoroscopic exam in a patient who has had a, uh, a Zanker's diverticulotomy, as you're seeing in the video above. And depending on who your reading radiologist is, they may call this an incomplete you know, resection of their of patient's diverticulum. Um, you're not gonna have actually full resection of the diverticulum. You're still going to see it on exam. Important to note the, the wall between them, and that's the distinction between a, a Zanker's uh, that has been treated and one that is not. Um, so if you see something like this, this would be an indicative of a more uh, treated Zanker's diverticulum rather than one that is still pathologic. All right, another thing that you may see in this posterior hypopharyngeal area is uh, problems with the, the cervical spine. Uh, osteophytes, um, you know, be they due to something like diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis or DISH, as you can see in this particular patient here, um, these types of things can cause significant obstruction. So this patient's epiglottis isn't even allowed to invert because it's hitting these osteophytes. Um, you know, there's obstruction at the level of the osteophytes. You're getting retained, uh, retained contrast in the pharynx itself, which predisposes the patient to a significant amount of aspiration. Um, so again, these are types of things that you may want to look for when, um, when you're evaluating the area. Um, these can also be significant from the standpoint of how they're managed this patient were to go in for you know, an anterior approach to resection of these osteophytes, or even patients who are having anterior cervical spine surgery just as part of, of nerve issues. Um, I know here at Cornell, we do a lot of approaches for our neurosurgery and ortho colleagues for their ACDF surgeries. Um, having that type of, uh, of surgery performed on the spine can predispose to things like traction diverticula as well, uh, where either the hardware or scarring from the approach can lead to traction on that posterior pharyngeal wall uh, and lead to diverticular formation, uh, which you may also see on loro exam. Uh, those are a little more significant. They tend to be more complicated and harder to manage. You can have a hardware eroding uh, through, through the diverticulum. Um, so you just kind of need to make sure that you're aware of the patient's surgical history before you jump into managing something like a Zanker's diverticulum. That may be the cause. All right, so let's move on now to talking about posterior cricoid findings specifically. Um, so the first ones I want to talk about are not necessarily pathologic findings, but common ones that you may see regardless and may mistake their pathologic findings. Um, these are the posterior cricoid plication and the posterior cricoid uh, arch impression. So uh, the posterior cricoid plication is more of a kind of a mucosal redundancy from dilation of like the, the, the venous plexus uh, within the uh, mucosa in the area just directly behind the cricoid cartilage ring. Uh, which can lead to an indentation you would see on flora exam. Um, I think the main thing to note here is that it's usually a little mobile uh, a web that you might see in this area. It's generally more pathologic and we'll show you one in just a second, but um, you know, a web will be a little more static in nature, but this will have a little bit more movement to it. And that's generally how you distinguish the two. Um, 
versus something like a posterior cricoid arch impression. So you can see here a slight little indentation that is represented uh, representative of the body of the uh, posterior lamina of the cricoid indenting into the pharynx. Generally not significant from uh, a pathology standpoint, which is something to kind of pay attention to. And these can be pretty common in even normal subjects. Uh, in one review by Allen and all from 2010, um, they found arch impressions in uh, about 16% of patients and controls. Um, uh, so that's normal people without any swallowing difficulties who presented and had a fluoro exam, still had it that you know, that frequently on their exam versus these plications tend to be a little more common in patients with, uh, with pathology or you know, symptoms of dysphagia. But nevertheless, even in controls, uh, you know, up to 30% of patients um, will still have something like a plication on their fluoro exam. But let's jump into the webs, which are a little bit more relevant from a pathology standpoint. Um, so as you'll see here in this, uh, this patient, this patient's got a really significant anterior cricoid web. And this one is definitely a thin one. You can see how it's fixed and doesn't move as the contrast passes over it. Um, and while uh, this patient's having you know, a fair amount of contrast pass through and make it into the distal portion of the pharyngoesophageal segment during the swallow, um, this may be something where you'll have a lot more of an issue with solid foods rather than liquids. Uh, as you'll see in a later portion of the same exam, where the patient swallows a 13 millimeter barium tablet uh, and you'll watch it fall. Uh, and as it sits right here, it gets stuck at the level of this cricopharyngeal web. And I didn't include the entire video because uh, this, in this actual video, this, um, this tablet sits there for about three and a half minutes before finally uh, being washed down with enough water, it dissolves to the point where it then plops down into the distal esophagus. But just goes to show you that you know, a web can be pretty significant. Uh, and cause significant obstruction, uh, particularly with solid foods when large enough. Um, and these webs are really common. In another study by Dr. Belosky's group out of UC Davis, um, in, I think they found uh, about 60%, if not higher, incidence uh, in the elderly population. So over 65, uh, those patients will have webs very frequently. Uh, I think it's kind of relevant to note that you know, this is not something that we encounter super frequently at a lot of other institutions across the country. Uh, it may be kind of a, a sampling bias for their institution as they're a well-known dysphagia center. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's not unreasonable to think that we're often missing these uh, on these exams. And part of that could be due to the way fluoroscopy is performed at different institutions. Uh, if your institution is performing their barium swallows with a six frame per second uh, rate of recording, it could be pretty easy to miss something like a small web. Um, that's why it's important to make sure that wherever you're having these done, that the radiologists perform them and record them so that you can review them at 30 frames per second to see as many frames as possible where you might catch these small webs that you would otherwise miss. Um, just kind of talking about some other types of pathology that you may see um, to kind of round things out a little bit. Obviously, I know we deal with head and neck cancer very frequently, so hypopharyngeal cancers in particular are going to be uh, something that would cause obstruction at the level of the pharyngoesophageal segment and need to keep those in mind, as well as the treatment for head and neck cancer. Radiation is a well-known culprit for dysphagia uh, by virtue of causing fibrosis and scarring um, wherever you know, treatment occurs. Um, and the pharyngoesophageal segment is no exception to that rule. Significant amount of fibrosis and scarring of those muscles will really inhibit the amount of opening that that segment can undergo during swallowing. And if, this, um, if a patient is not able to significantly open up that segment combined with maybe some decreased sensory changes from radiation, you're going to be at a significantly higher risk for aspiration. Uh, surgical changes can also uh, lead to significant findings uh, in this area. Um, so this is a patient, for example, that had a narrow field laryngectomy. Um, and you know whether or not this is related to just the cricopharyngeus muscle being left behind versus just the tightness of the closure itself, you can see a significant amount of obstruction here uh, at the level of what would have been the cricopharyngeus muscle if it's not still present, uh, where there's a lot of retention of contrast materials. So keeping in mind what was done surgically uh, and how that can impact swallowing is also really important. And then again, there are intrinsic uh, aspects of the muscles themselves, like we mentioned before with things like inclusion body myositis and oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy um, and other neurologic conditions. And then you can't forget just regular old laryngitis, pharyngitis, things like LPR can certainly cause enough irritation and inflammation to obstruct that area in more severe instances. Uh, and then things like, you know, a stroke, which is going to cause diffuse muscle weakness in certain instances where, you know, especially like a brainstem stroke, um, where the pharynx is not able to contract. Uh, there's lack of coordination between these muscles involved in the pharyngoesophageal segment. So important to kind of keep a, a comprehensive view of potential pathology in mind when evaluating this area.
All right, so let's move on to treatment options now and talk a little bit about where we use different ones for different types of pathology, starting with the more conservative uh, areas. So the first thing that you can attempt with any of these patients that's gonna have an obstruction at the level of the pharyngoesophageal segment is um, diet modifications. Uh, something that's gonna be a more liquid diet or a more slippery diet, as we often say, is gonna be easier for that patient to get that food, get the liquid through the pharyngeal esophageal segment, uh, through that PES segment. Um, and then there are also a lot of maneuvers that our therapy colleagues can uh, employ with patients to help get them to strengthen this area so that it can function a little more efficiently. Um, one of the more common uh, maneuvers that this uh, that is done to help the pharyngeal uh, esophageal segment is the Mendelssohn maneuver, which uh, if you've never tried, it's uh, somewhat difficult to intuitively uh, get to do, but um, it's essentially when you swallow, if you feel your own uh, larynx elevate during a swallow, it's a, an effort made to try and hold that uh, high elevation of the larynx at the top of the swallow and maintain that for a few seconds, which has uh, been shown to significantly strengthen suprahyoid musculature and help increase the amount of uh, pharyngoesophageal segment opening uh, and the duration of PES opening as well. So important to keep that in mind as an option for helping strengthen this, uh, this musculature when treating patients. Something like a head turn may also be useful, uh, not necessarily for the PES itself, but um, maybe if you have a patient who has a weak pharynx, particularly on one side from say, a nerve injury or a stroke, um, a weak pharynx is not going to dilate as well. And turning the head towards the side of the weakness will uh, essentially close off that aspect of the piriform sinus and pharynx a little bit more and direct an incoming bolus towards the opposite side, allowing that side to propel it a little more easily through the pharyngeal segment. Uh, and then lastly, the shaker exercise is another uh, really great and effective exercise that can be uh, implemented by patients to help strengthen their suprahyoid musculature. And this is done by having the patient lay supine with their shoulders on, uh, on a table uh, and elevating their chin to their chest and sustaining that position while kind of looking at their toes for uh, several seconds. And it's this sustained elevated head maneuver that really helps strengthen the suprahyoid musculature. And it's been shown to improve upper esophageal sphincter opening, uh, to increase the anterior laryngeal excursion, uh, as well as decrease the amount of pressure within a hypopharyngeal bolus during a swallow. Um, it's also important not to forget about reflux management. Um, as we you know, showed earlier with that one esophagram, uh, reflux can be a significant contributor to the amount of uh, tonic contraction that a cricopharyngeus muscle uh, or the PES segment in general um, has at baseline. So making sure that uh, acid is under control and reflux is well managed will certainly help take off that extra irritant and uh, inflammatory effect that you would see on the PES from acid reflux. And to kind of drive that home, there was a study done last year that was published uh, by Miller et al that looked at um, upper esophageal sphincter manometry specifically in response to swallowing uh, different consistencies of, of acid. So uh, looking at neutral pH swallows all the way down to 1.8 pH swallows. Um, they were able to show there was a significant uh, impact on upper esophageal sphincter uh, uh, restitution tone. So basically um, when, when swallowing a normal pH bolus, um, the, there was restitution to normal uh, relaxation pressures uh, sorry, to normal uh, resting pressures uh, versus swallowing a 1.8 highly acidic swallow over that PES segment um, led to a lot of oscillation essentially and increased pressure following the swallow. So you can imagine how over a longer period of time that significant uh, chronic exposure to acid would have an impact on the resting pressure of the upper esophageal sphincter and potentially uh, even the opening pressure, making it more difficult to pass something through that segment. Other things that can be employed, especially from a therapy standpoint, um, are things like massage to the area. So one thing to kind of bring up is uh, a newer entity that's kind of becoming a little more well-known and that's uh, muscle tension dysphagia. Uh, I know a lot of us know muscle tension dysphonia as a pretty common uh, culprit for voice issues in the laryngology world. Uh, muscle tension dysphagia uh, can present not just as a swallowing issue, but sometimes as, uh, as more of a globus sensation in the neck. Um, but you know, massage to help release some of the tension that's being held in these muscles uh, can certainly have an impact in some patients for their symptoms. Uh, for example, this was one of the patients we had here at the Voice Institute who came in with globus sensation. Um, and as you can see, at a really high uh, uh, maximum upper esophageal sphincter pressure that after a period of uh, manual circumlaryngeal massage uh, was able to drop that pressure pretty significantly. You can see that the change in warmer colors to slightly cooler colors 
uh, in the upper esophageal sphincter um, after some time spent with that maneuver. And that actually dropped a little bit more uh, with a, a head turn also implemented at the same time. So another thing to kind of mention as a, uh, a newer tool in, in the management of uh, pharyngeal dysphagia uh, is the use of high, uh, high resolution manometry, pharyngeal manometry uh, specifically, with biofeedback as a adjunct treatment for dysphagia in certain patients. So biofeedback is a you know kind of a well-established uh, phenomenon uh, in, in therapy and treatment, um, but the goal is really to train individuals to kind of self-regulate a physiologic process um, that is normally not considered to be under voluntary control. So using this kind of extrasensory input to help change a, a physiologic process. And um, so this is from Dr. O uh, Dr. Ashley O'Rourke's group at uh, the, uh, MUSC, they've been doing a lot of work with this in pharyngeal uh, manometry for biofeedback purposes and therapy. Um, so the patient is shown their own manometry while being given different exercises and uh, asked to kind of implement changes um, to help make adjustments based on what they're seeing on the screen. And for example, using the Mendelssohn maneuver. So what we're looking at here is um, just the, the top segment of that manometry where you see the pharyngeal, uh, the pharyngeal aspect of, of swallowing and then the upper esophageal sphincter as this continuous line. So patients being asked to perform a Mendelssohn maneuver and after repeated attempts, remember that's you're elevating the larynx and trying to hold everything higher at the top of that swallow and maintain that tension. You can see gradually improved efforts where they're able to increase that pressure and sustain it longer and longer, increasing the pressure of the upper esophageal sphincter. But what this also has been shown to do is um, not just increase um, you know, that sustain, but increase the PCI, which is the pharyngeal contractile integral. It's essentially just a measurement of pharyngeal uh, contraction strength or vigor. Um, so that improves uh, as, as this has been implemented. The length with which the upper esophageal sphincter is open uh, is also going to increase with time. Uh, and then the relaxation pressure specifically of the UES is also going to improve with repeated attempts with this biofeedback. Uh, and then this is also useful, not just for uh, during the swallow specifically, but um, Maggie Kuhn's group uh, at UC Davis looked at um, using biofeedback to adjust upper esophageal sphincter resting pressure specifically, and they were able to show uh, similar effects in modifying um, resting pressures to be higher uh, by basically just having the patient kind of focus on the screen uh, and do whatever that you know, they felt they could to make these colors change in the different directions they were asked and they were able to do that. So there's a potentially a role here in, in managing different types of conditions with biofeedback as an adjuvant uh, measure to standard treatment modalities that we already employ pretty routinely. But moving from the more conservative side of things to procedural intervention, um, let's start you know, kind of right at the top of the, the workhorse for addressing the UES that, that almost all of us have used before as at least ENT surgeons, uh, and that's dilation. Um, there are lots of different ways with which dilation can be achieved for the pharyngoesophageal segment. Um, you know, the, the, classic Maloney uh, the, the classic Maloney dilators uh, have been used before, often done blindly, just passing this um, through the esophagus. Savory dilators, uh, similar, but have the added benefit of being able to be passed over a guide wire just to help improve um, you know, accuracy of passing and, and minimize trauma in the process. Uh, and then balloons are becoming a very useful tool as well. Uh, really targeted, directed dilation at a specific area. Um, and I think at this point, it's important to, to kind of talk a little bit more about the size and shape of the pharyngoesophageal segment specifically, um, you know, when we're considering doing something like a dilation, because the pharyngoesophageal segment is not round. It's actually more kind of shaped like a kidney bean. Um, and uh, there was a study done by Dr. Belowski's group again, uh, this was, I think, two years ago, we're using uh, fresh frozen cadaver heads um, instilled with uh, kind of an epoxy mold. They were able to basically get a shape of what the entire pharynx and airway looks like, and then uh, scan this to give you a good cross-section view. So here at, uh, at A, that would be the level of the glottis, and uh, you can see in the piriform sinuses and post-cricoid area, when fully dilated, you start to see this kidney bean shape that's actually fairly large and not round. And then especially at the level of the cricophrygeous muscle, which you see at B, still maintains that same shape all the way down to the pinch just below the cricopharyngeus where it then starts to round off as you get into the upper esophagus specifically. You can imagine if you're trying to pass like a 20 millimeter balloon into this area, you're really only gonna cover you know, a significant amount of one side rather than the entire PES as a whole. 
which can be significant when you're trying to dilate, say, for example, a cricopharyngeal web. Um, if you have one area that's blocked off and you have a really large area, but a balloon only so big, it's going to tend towards the area of least resistance. So um, while this is certainly, you know, the first step in dilating and managing something like a large cricopharyngeal web, um, you're clearly not going to have the same effect that you would if you had something that really encompassed that full area, which leads to um, strategy that the UC Davis group really kind of uh, pioneered and developed, and that's the double balloon technique. Um, and they did this as kind of a series of three double balloon technique to maximize efficiency with dilation and the effect that you get out of doing so. So they have this kind of a, it's a three-step process starting with a 20 millimeter balloon, like you saw in the first picture, as the first step, uh, waiting two weeks and then proceeding with a two balloon dilation done simultaneously. Um, second one being uh, two, um, the 15 millimeter, 15 millimeter balloons. Uh, and this is a video showing you how this is done. Now, these dilations can actually be done in an awake patient. Um, one balloon is a little more easily achievable in the awake patient in clinic. Two balloons tends to be a lot of pressure uh, and it's probably best performed under at least moderate sedation um, in the procedural suite or the operating room, but not necessarily you know, under full general anesthesia. But you can see getting one balloon in there, uh, this can all be done transnasally through the nose with a guide wire passed kind of sidecar to the scope to allow you to get the balloon in there, um, allows you to get two balloons into the area held in place and dilate to a more representative kind of kidney bean shape um, that is the more natural shape of the cricopharyngeus opening and BES opening as a whole. And then ultimately you get uh, two 18 millimeter balloons and that would be what that would look like in this particular situation. And with this series of three, they've shown pretty significant improvements uh, in not just uh, the anterior, posterior and uh, lateral opening of the pharyngoesophageal segment that you would see on fluoro exam, um, but also in patient symptom reports. Um, so on the E10, which is just a uh, head dysphagia inventory questionnaire um, that uh, you know, anything over three is essentially considered abnormal, patients reported significant improvement, still having symptoms afterwards, but a notable improvement, which is relevant, uh, and a similar you know, decrease in symptoms, uh, not completely, but still significant on the functional oral intake scale. And then here you can see uh, this is an example of a patient that underwent a double dilation, a series of three. Uh, you can see a significant cricopharyngeal bar and uh, obstruction at the level of the PES that significantly improved following that series of three dilation. So moving on now to another uh, kind of common workhorse that we often talk about when managing the pharyngoesophageal segment, and that's Botox. Um, it's a, a common tool that's implemented for lots of different things in ENT, but specifically uh, when we're talking about the pharyngoesophageal segment, we're referring to Botox of the cricopharyngeus muscle specifically. And this can be done in different ways. This can be done in the operating room uh, under direct visualization, either with a diverticuloscope uh, or even just a regular DITO or some other type of laryngoscope. It adequately kind of pooches up that cricopharyngeal muscle along the posterior wall of the pharynx as you advance the scope distally. Um, and you know, just an injection into the body of the muscle is performed to, to give you uh, the results that you need. If that's not able to be performed, either due to patient anatomy or patient can't tolerate no anesthesia, uh, a Botox injection to the CP can still be performed in clinic. It's much harder, a little less reliable, uh, but it's done by, in much the way you would do a, um, a PCA injection for spasmodic dysphonia, you would want to aim the needle posteriorly behind the laryngeal skeleton, uh, aiming again posteriorly rather than more immediately towards the PCA so that you're into the body of the cricopharyngeus muscle. Having the patient sniff so that uh, you're making sure you're not in that, uh, that PCA muscle, uh, you should not hear any signal. If you do, <laughs> you know you're injecting in the wrong spot. Uh, and then uh, potentially you could also have the patient swallow. Because the muscle is tonically contracted at rest, you should see activity when you're in the muscle, both on insertion and sustained. Uh, and then as the patient swallows, so long as you're able to stay in the muscle during elevation of the larynx, you'll see that activity actually drop off and then return once the larynx uh, returns to its normal resting position. But it's important to remember when you're doing these injections, your location is important not just because of the PCA muscle and the potential impact that you can have on the patient's respiratory status when you're injecting, but also they're swallowing, not just for improvement's sake, but also for potentially worsening it. Because as you can see, you're really close to these uh, inferior pharyngeal constrictors when you are injecting into the cricopharyngeus muscle. So um, the possibility of diffusion of that Botox into those inferior constrictors is very real. And depending on the age of your patient in particular or their comorbidities, um, that can have a much more potentially serious effect on their ability to contract their pharynx and have a more efficient swallow. 
but you may give them a very weak pharynx just by passive diffusion of the Botox and predispose them to significantly higher risk of aspiration. Dosage can also be important here. Um, higher doses are usually safer in younger people. Um, you may wanna be a little more conservative with your dose in someone who's older for some of those same aforementioned reasons. Um, the other thing that you can do if you're not treating the muscle chemically is you can surgically cut the muscle to achieve that same effect of opening up that pharyngoesophageal segment. Um, the endoscopic approach to CP myotomy has been uh, adequately described. Um, these pictures are from, uh, from Dr. Dr. Pittman's group uh, back in 2009, where they uh, did a good review on how the procedure is done and what you should expect. Though usually done uh, either, th again, through a diverticuloscope, um, slimline, weirda, or potentially even a dito, where you can expose that bar, that muscle, um, and using a laser, make an incision through the mucosa down through the muscle all the way until you completely transect the muscle and reach that buccopharyngeal fascia. Um, going beyond that predisposes you to a uh, risk of extravasation of uh, food and liquid uh, into potentially dangerous spaces in the neck. But, um, but making sure you stay above that uh, also helps prevent things like um, mediastinitis and infection. So been shown to be significantly uh, effective for, for treating uh, dysphagia as a result of CP hypertrophy or obstruction. Um, but this can also be done the old fashioned way of, of an open approach. Uh, it's traditionally a much more challenging approach and takes more time. There's a couple of advantages to both. Um, I mean, one, identifying the CP muscle is a little notoriously difficult. Um, distinguishing the fibers of the inferior constrictors from the CP muscle itself uh, and the upper esophageal fibers uh, can, be, can be difficult, especially when you're you know, in the open surgical view, um, which is why traditionally this surgery is done by making sure you kind of do a wide myotomy, including some of those inferior pharyngeal fibers and upper esophageal fibers, just to ensure that the muscle is completely transected. But there are potentially some benefits to doing this open. Um, you know, for one, you're not entering into the, the uh, pharyngeal mucosa, so patients are able to get back on a diet a little bit much more quickly than they would otherwise. Uh, some people often like to get a swallow study after an endoscopic approach to ensure there's no extravasation of contrast. Um, but with this, you don't necessarily have to. Um, it's a little more invasive, obviously, as an open procedure. So there's that to deal with. But um, you don't have to deal with the, the pharyngeal rent that, you're, that you would have in the endoscopic approach. Um, and then, you know, showing the effectiveness of these procedures uh, in general. Um, the study out of the late 90s uh, by Mason et al., uh, two different studies actually, that just showed that there's, when these procedures are done, there's a 79% total improvement across the board for all comers that undergo a CP myotomy. Um, it just kind of emphasizes the importance of patient selection. Not everyone has the same excellent improvement. Certain conditions are gonna have uh, you know, higher fail rates, like a stroke patient may not have the best benefit from a CP myotomy as uh, someone who, um, as a much more easily treatable uh, pathology by this method. <clears throat> but uh, what it did show was there was significantly decreased intrabolus pressures and decreased peak pharyngeal pressures following the procedure. Uh, so now, you know, we're talking about, uh, we've talked about opening up the pharyngeal esophageal segment through uh, addressing the cricopharyngeus muscle. Um, now I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about uh, ways of improving the pharyngeal esophageal segment from moving the laryngeal framework specifically off of the, uh, the skeleton. So um, this is what's called a laryngohyoid suspension procedure. Uh, it's a very open invasive procedure, but uh, it's, a, it's a useful trick in someone who's kind of at the end of the line, not really having a, uh, a good response to therapy efforts that have been done before. Not universally effective. It's somewhat of a coin toss as far as the um, rates of improvement that you're gonna see after the surgery. But in someone who's not able to elevate their larynx at all and not able to distend that pharyngoesophageal segment, um, you know, this surgery where you kind of tether the uh, thyroid cartilage here to the hyoid bone, shortening that distance, and then tethering the hyoid bone to the mandible really helps lift the larynx off of the spine uh, and up under the tongue to help distend that PES a little bit more to uh, help propel the bolus a little bit more naturally towards the posterior hypopharynx and, and into the esophagus. Uh, another uh, strategy I wanted to mention, which is not commonly utilized by anyone really outside of UC Davis, where Dr. Belosky has publicized this, uh, but it's a really kind of interesting uh, treatment modality, I think, eloquently uh, uh, exemplifies how the pharyngoesophageal segment functions uh, as, a, as a unit. Um, this is actually a swallow expansion device is what it's called, and it's an implant that goes on the anterior face of the cricoid cartilage. Uh, and much akin to like a bone anchored hearing aid where you have a small metal ring uh, that is going to sit outside of the skin. And that ring is gonna be used 
by the patient to actually physically distend their larynx off of their C-spine, opening the pharyngoesophageal segment and allowing uh, passage of contents through that. So as you can see here, this patient, uh, this is before implantation of their swallow expansion device. Um, they have significant obstruction at the level of the pharyngoesophageal segment. You can see the device in place now, and how it actually distracts the larynx off of the C-spine, widening that pharyngoesophageal segment. And as you'll see in a second with a swallow, um, that bolus is able to much more easily clear the pharyngoesophageal segment with traction anteriorly on this device. So again, this is not something that is commonly uh, employed. It is uh, still very much investigational, but I, I think it really is a nice demonstration of the physiology of the area. And then lastly, kind of at the end stage of managing uh, BES dysfunction um, is, you know, one thing that can happen when the pharyngoesophageal segment is not functioning correctly is aspiration. And being able to address that aspect of difficulty for patients is still important as far as the wheelhouse of things that we can offer our patients. Um, one of these is a tubed epiglottoplasty, uh, which essentially involves a, a suturing of the posterior aspect of the epiglottis and, um, and pharyngoepiglottic ligaments to uh, form a literal tube that helps prevent reflux of contents back up into the posterior aspect of the larynx uh, and helping to prevent aspiration. Not universally effective, um, but in some patients, it, it can be very helpful in doing this. Uh, other procedures that can be employed are things like a um, narrow field or even total laryngectomy in patients who just wanna be able to swallow again um, to avoid that issue of aspiration altogether um, by giving them a permanent stoma and a, a single tract through which they can eat and swallow, uh, or something like a laryngotracheal separation with or without diversion of the proximal stump into the esophagus. Um, in a patient who has uh, you know, retained vocal function, uh, I had one patient, for example, that we treated um, uh, a couple years back who had pretty, uh, pretty normal vocal function following radiation for a small laryngeal cancer, but had terrible sensory issues to where they were aspirating and had to be NPO to where they were peg dependent. Um, so we actually offered them this procedure with a TEP afterwards. Uh, so they were able to still voice normally, um, but didn't have to worry about the aspiration issues they were having before. So a useful trick in the right patient for sure. All right, so we've talked about a lot of issues. Andrew, yes, sir. Andrew, you were at eight o'clock. And okay. I think people may have to go rather than going into this. I wonder if uh, you might answer one question if uh, yeah. somebody has one. For sure. Give me one sec to pop them up. I don't know that there are any. Does anybody have any questions for Andrew? If not, I just want to kind of touch real quick on, on this. And I'll just I'll run through it. Um, just so everyone's aware, this is a, a new type of pathology that, um, that really hasn't been adequately to discussed and described until recently. Uh, and that's retrograde cricophingous dysfunction, uh, which is essentially the inability uh, to belch, um, which sounds you know, kind of unusual, but it's becoming a much more common problem. Um, and it was popularized by, by Bastian in 2019. Um, and um, there were very minimal case reports before it, but Important to note, these patients have a significant difficulty from their inability to belch where they essentially get a lot of abdominal bloating and discomfort. Uh, they get these socially awkward gurgling noises um, and they're socially inhibited as a result of this. Um, and it's easily managed by Botox injections um, just you know, to the cricopharyngeus. And they have pretty sustained long, uh, long lasting benefit from doing so. Um, but what's really interesting here is this is a case where social media has really kind of driven uh, the issues uh, of condition and patients are starting to bring this to, uh, to the mainframe rather than physicians kind of making it more common and well known. So um, social media, again, really kind of driving this um, and Botox is a very easy treatment for this. Um, the way it's usually done is one injection in the OR, 80% of patients will get a sustained response rate um, versus a uh, non-responder rate of 20%. They usually respond at a rate of, again, about 80% uh, after a repeat injection. Uh, and these patients, uh, I encourage you to kind of go online to the Reddit forums and TikTok forums and see all these videos people are posting of how happy they are with such a simple intervention uh, from just being able to now release this pressure they've kind of literally held in their, their esophagus their entire life. Um, you can also consider myotomy as kind of like the end stage uh, if they don't respond to Botox. And anyway, thank you very much for uh, terrifically comprehensive and thorough talk uh, on this rapidly evolving topic. Um, I don't think anybody in the audience is gonna hear another such really complete overview of the topic. Um, so thank you, that was terrific. And it looks like you've got a QR code for references there, which is a great idea. Let's leave that up for a little bit.
Hi, uh, Andrew. Thank you so much for your talk. That was uh, really well done. I just wanted to uh, make a comment because it's uh, often uh, thought in the US that uh, the Belavsky group uh, had discovered that the PES is uh, kidney bean shape, but that was already uh, known for several years in Japan and they already had established uh, elliptical balloons to dilate the PES. And I think it's really important to uh, give them um, credit for that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely, I mentioned that one paper as a, just a, a nice demonstration of the process, but no, that's an important point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about the dose of botulinum toxin, if you're going to treat uh, CP hyperfunction with that. Yeah. How much so, did you put in? So th this is a, a not really well-studied topic. There's a ton of variability across practitioners as far as the amount that you would instill. Um, there were certain papers, I think from the 90s, talking about doses of five to 15 units and the kind of benefits you would get from that. Uh, they saw, I think, a decreased response rate when using those lower doses. Um, but, you know, for example, in, I know a lot of people that will give up to 100 units even for microphoryngeal dysfunction, which seems like a ton for a pretty small muscle. Um, and again, with the potential risk for diffusion into the inferior constrictors, um, you do have a lot of risk of, of dysphagia following this. So, for example, I know um, our the, the retrograde cricopharyngeal uh, dysfunction patients that we see, um, they frequently have some, uh, they get, you know, somewhere between 50 to 75 units usually. Um, and they often have a couple weeks of significant dysphagia where they have to stick to so, uh, softer foods uh, in order and, to kind of get through that. And the question of diffusion makes the volume of the injection as important as the dose. Definitely. So right, so the sure more volume you inject, the likelier you are to get diffusion to muscles you don't mean to weaken. For sure. Um, and, and do you inject two sites, one site? What's the pattern of injection? Again, not a really well established thing as far as the literature is concerned. Um, you know, there is some evidence that the innervation, uh, if you're looking at the actual uh, neuromuscular junctions within the CP, kind of sit on the lateral aspects of the muscles. So that's probably where you want to target your injections. Um, but I've seen people do two injections, three injections, four injections. Um, but I don't know of any data that actually looks at the differences in outcomes between a uh, number of sites and locations. Good. Thank you, Dr. Kalash. Thank you for your questions. Um, Andrew, thank you for the talk. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, super informative. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.